The IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship is set for an incredible season featuring new cars and full grids. But for many new fans, it can be difficult to understand what's going on out on track. Buckle up as I take you through everything that you need to know about IMSA. In order to understand present day IMSA, you need to understand some of its past. IMSA was born in 1969 by John Bishop and his wife Peggy. At the time, they also received help from the founder of NASCAR, Bill France Sr., to create a North American sports car series that focused on road course racing. Early races were usually contested with Formula V and Formula Ford machinery, and it was not until 1971 that endurance GT racing began. During the 70s and into the 80s, IMSA would be picking up steam. They'd land big sponsors like Camel Cigarettes and begin to establish themselves as one of the premier sports car championships in North America. However, the end of the 1980s would not go as smoothly for IMSA, as founder John Bishop would have to undergo heart surgery, which would eventually lead to him selling the series. This really led into a rocky patch of history for IMSA, as during the 90s, the series almost folded and was actually sold three times. It was not until 1998 when Don Panos purchased the series and would change the name to the American Le Mans series, or ALMS. This era would see the alignment between the newly created ALMS and the ACO who organized the 24 Hours of Le Mans. This would lead to the introduction of a new race called the Petit Le Mans that would be held annually at Road Atlanta. However, there were some more rocky patches brewing. Shortly after the announcement of the American Le Mans series came the establishment of the Grand Am Road Racing Series. Like ALMS, Grand Am had prototypes and Grand Touring cars that competed in their premier Rolex sports car series. And while ALMS had premier events such as the 12 Hours of Sebring and the Petit Le Mans race, Grand Am had the Rolex 24 as well as the 6 Hours of the Glen. These two rival series would carry on as separate series in North American sports car racing until 2012 when it was announced that the two would merge into what we now know as IMSA. Currently named the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, it has blossomed since the merger in 2012 and has become the premier sports car racing championship in North America featuring some of the most prestigious endurance races in the world. Now a typical IMSA race weekend does not just consist of the race itself. It's made up of many sessions that are usually spread over three to four days. Some weekends will vary slightly but usually things get underway on Thursday with a track walk for the drivers and teams. This gives them the ability to walk the track and observe any changes that may have happened to the course since the previous time they were there. This is usually followed up by practice sessions or maybe even some qualifying sessions for some of the support series that weekend. Friday is usually when the main event takes to the track with uh, them having their first practice sessions. There will be some more qualifying sessions for again some of the support series and usually this is when we start to see the first racing action for the support series. Saturday is qualifying day for the WeatherTech Championship. It's also race day for many of the remaining support series races. And then finally, of course, this leaves Sunday for race day. And an IMSA race can range anywhere from an hour and 40 minutes all the way up to the 24 hour long Rolex 24. In the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, it features five classes, the GTP class, LMP2, LMP3, GTD Pro, and GTD categories. And one of the unique things about IMSA, and also other sports car championships around the world, is that these class cars, despite there being basically five races going on at once, they are all out on track sharing that track at the same time. The only time that these classes are really divided up is for qualifying. In qualifying, first cars out on the track are the GTD and GTD Pro cars. They go out there for 15 minutes to determine their race starting positions. And some driver notes for these qualifying sessions that in GTD Pro, any driver can qualify the car. And a new rule introduced in 2023 for GTD also allows anyone to drive the car. However, in GTD, if the driver that qualifies the car is a bronze rated driver, then for the start of the race, that car will be able to change tires and fit a brand new set of tires, which can be a significant advantage when your competitors are all out there on 
tires that have been pushed hard for a qualifying session. LMP3 is next up for their 15 minute qualifying session. Only a bronze rated driver or a silver rated driver under the age of 25 is allowed to qualify the car. LMP2 is up next for their dedicated 15 minute qualifying session where a bronze driver has to qualify that car. And the last class to qualify are the GTP class cars where they get a 20 minute qualifying session and any driver is able to qualify that car. During the race, of course, all five cars will again be back out on track together. And while they might not necessarily be racing against one another, you'll frequently see the faster class cars be passing their slower class counterparts. Basically, it's important to remember this. Cars will only be racing against other cars that are within their same class. So GTP will only matter for position if they're passing another GTP car. LMP3 is the same thing. The positioning is only going to matter if they're passing a fellow LMP3 competitor. Using this scenario, if a GTP class car passes an LMP3 car, which will happen frequently in a race, it doesn't really mean anything for the finishing results. And as a result, you will oftentimes hear two different positions mentioned on a broadcast. Overall position is where the car is running in the overall race, considering every single other car that's out on track. So in this scenario, that LMP3 car might be running 25th overall, and that GTP class car might be running 3rd overall. However, the pass that the GTP car just made on the LMP3 doesn't mean anything in the overall standings. Position in class only takes into consideration the car's position in relation to other cars in their class. So that LMP3 car that was running 25th overall when you consider against the cars that it's racing against, their fellow LMP3 competitors, they were actually running third in the LMP3 class and therefore are running third in class. As we talked about a minute ago, an IMSA race can last anywhere from an hour and 40 minutes up to 24 hours. And it's not just one driver that completes the entire race. Teams will use between two and four drivers and you might be asking, well, just how long does a driver stay in the car? Well, for the 24 hour event at day Daytona, one driver can do a maximum of 13 hours of driving. And a rule for all events is that a driver can only complete four hours of driving in any six hour time period. There is a minimum drive time that is enforced for each event, but this will vary based on the length of the race. Again, we're talking about races anywhere from an hour and 40 minutes up to 24 hours. Generally, each driver needs to race about 45 minutes to an hour for each two hour and 40 minute race. However, for the Endurance Cup events, the longer events like the 24 hours, this will of course be longer. A balance of performance or BOP is applied to cars racing in the GTP and GTD category. Categories. This helps to even out any manufacturer advantages between the cars. This is done by putting limits on car parameters such as engine power, aerodynamics, and weight. And the BOP is generally announced in the week leading up to the race. Heavy penalties have been handed out in the past to teams who have sandbagged or intentionally gone slow in order to positively affect their BOP. In fact, Lamborghini was hit with a very severe penalty in 2016 after they sandbagged during the BOP process and ended up going on to dominate that Rolex 24. A couple of more quick points about these classes are that all cars feature an illuminated box on the side of the car called a leader light. This leader light will denote the position that that car is running in their respective class. All cars use Michelin tires and rain will not stop the running of the race as they do have rain tires at their disposal. Getting those tires changed requires a pit stop. And regardless of how long the race is, cars will need to make pit stops at some point during the race. During a pit stop, four crewmen are allowed over the wall to perform routine maintenance such as tire changes, refueling, setup adjustments, and small repairs. You'll also see a driver change take place as part of these pit stops. And when a driver change is taking place, an additional crew member is allowed over the wall to help assist the driver not only getting out of the car, but the one getting into the car to help fasten seat belts, make sure that everything is good to go in the car, attach any safety nets, and get that car off and running. Fueling and tire changes also take place at the same time. One thing to remember though is that there is a minimum refueling time for all cars. By essentially making the, the refueling the longest part of the pit stop, 
What it does is ensures that crews take some additional time for some safety things like making sure all the lug nuts are tight on the wheels so that a wheel doesn't come off when the driver goes back out on track. And it also helps to keep costs down. For instance, if you look at a Formula One pit stop, those teams invest millions of dollars into every aspect of that pit stop to make sure that it goes as quickly as possible. By ensuring that this refueling portion takes the longest amount of time, it makes sure that other tasks around the car can be completed safely before the car goes back out on track. You remember that leader light from just a minute ago? Well, during a pit stop, it turns pink and it indicates the amount of time that the car has been in the pit box. A few more quick notes about pit stops are that brake changes are something that you will see done on a pit stop, but only for the big endurance races, usually like the Rolex 24 or even the Sebring 12 hours. No tire blankets are used to help bring the tire temps up on pit road and the tires remain at the normal air temperature. You won't see a crew member bring out a jack either to hoist the car up. That's because built-in air jacks deploy when a crew member connects an air hose to the car. Teams have a set number of tires allocated to them during each race and interestingly enough in the GTP class this year teams will actually have to double stint their tires. During the race there are two types of yellow flags that can be deployed. A local yellow could be waved for a small incident such as a driver spinning out on track and the local yellow will just be removed when that hazard is cleared. A full course yellow is deployed when there is a hazard on track that needs to be cleared in order for safe racing to resume. Usually a full course yellow is deployed if there's an incident involving cars that are unable to move afterwards or if there's debris out on track that may cause a hazard to fans, spectators, drivers, or, or track marshals. During a full course yellow, a pace car is deployed and pit stops are also usually performed. Now, IMSA handles their full course yellow procedures slightly different than other series do. And this procedure helps to minimize the amount of time lost that some cars can experience when the yellow is deployed and also helps teams to not unfairly lose a lap as a result of the yellow flag being deployed. I am going to attempt to simplify this full course yellow procedure for you. First, the safety car picks up the overall leader of the race and every car behind the overall leader must stay single file behind one another. Then the first pass around occurs. This allows any cars that have their class leader behind them in the line of cars to pull out past the safety car and continue driving around the track to rejoin the end of the line. After all cars that have got this first pass around have caught up, then pit stops can take place. The prototype classes, so the GTP, LMP2, and LMP3 classes are the first who get to pit. GT cars are not yet permitted to pit. On the following lap, after the prototypes have completed their stops, the GTD Pro and GTD cars may make their pit stops. After pit stops are completed, there may be a handful of cars directly behind a safety car that chose not to pit. As was allowed earlier, since these drivers have their class leader behind them on track, they are permitted to pass the safety car and continue driving around the track until they rejoin the end of the line. Oftentimes, cars that have lost a lap or more to their class leader will stay out and not pit in order to take advantage of this extra pass around and actually get back onto the lead lap. After this last wave around is completed, there may be cars mixed up with other class competitors. And this is where a class split takes place. At this time, G GTP class cars may pull out and pass the slower classes of cars in order to be the first class that lines up behind the safety car. So what this means is that all of the GTP class cars are going to be directly behind the safety car at this point. Next, the LMP2 and LMP3 cars may pull out and pass any of the GTD Pro or GTD class cars. This means that they will be the next class cars that are lining up behind the GTPs. Just note here that the LMP2s and the LMP3s may still be mixed up amongst one another, but that will remain that way for the restart. Basically how this breaks down is it means that the order of the restart is GTP class first, followed by a combined group of LMP2s and LMP3s, 
and then rounding out the field is a combined group of GTD Pro and GTD cars. When all of this is completed, the race director then instructs that safety car to come into the pits and racing can resume. As you might have noticed, there's kind of a lot of things that go on under these full course yellow conditions, and one of these full course yellows can last anywhere from 15 up to about 45 minutes in some instances, although those longer ones are usually for a lot of cleanup that needs to be done or possibly some track repairs. If you still find all of this confusing, I will link to a helpful document from IMSA in the show notes. At the end of the race, championship points are awarded to each competitor that finishes the race. First place will get 350 points, followed by second place 320, third gets 300, fourth gets 280, and fifth gets 260 points. Every position from there on down just decreases in increments of 10. Qualifying points are also awarded at a rate of 10% of the championship points. So for example, pole position gets 35 points, followed by 32 points, etc. And there are three championships that drivers and teams are aiming for. The overall and the Sprint Cup Championship both utilize the point system that I've just outlined, but the Michelin Endurance Cup is slightly different. Michelin Endurance Cup points are handed out at various points over the four endurance race events in the season. During these various times of the race, the race leader at the time will be awarded five points, second place gets four points, third place receives three points, and all other competitors that are still running receive two points. For the Rolex 20 24 hours at Daytona points are awarded for the Michelin Endurance Cup at the 6, 12, and 18 hour marks, as well as at the race finish. For the 12 hours of Sebring, points are awarded at the 4 hour mark, the 8 hour mark, and at race finish. For the 6 hours of the Glen, points are awarded at the 3 hour mark and at race finish. And for Motul Petit Le Mans, points are awarded at the 4 hour and 8 hour marks, as well as the race finish. All of these points are then added up to determine the Michelin Endurance Cup champion. The IMSA race calendar kicks off the 2023 schedule at the Roar before the 24, January 20th to 22nd. They carry on a week later for the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona and the first race of the season. Next up for the WeatherTech Championship, they head to Sebring for the 12 Hours of Sebring, March 15th to 18th. They head to Long Beach on April 14th and 15th for a one hour and 40 minute race, followed up by a trip to WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca for May 12th to 14th. The six hours of the Glen is held June 22nd to 25th, followed shortly after by the round at Canadian Tire Motorsport Park on July 7th to 9th. The GT only round at Lime Rock Park will go July 21st and 22nd, followed up by the round at Road America August 4th to 6th. The other GT only round of the season goes to Virginia International Raceway August 25th to 27th, followed by a new track to the IMSA calendar at Indianapolis Motor Speedway September 15th to 17th, and the season rounds up at Michelin Raceway Road Atlanta for Motul Petit Le Mans. Now that you've heard all about IMSA, it's time to learn some more about the classes that run in it. Starting with the GTP class, you can find out everything that you need to know right here. I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. If you too want to support the show, then you can head to patreon.com slash off in the S's. Once again, thanks for tuning in. I hope everyone has a great race weekend. It doesn't go off in the S's.